My name is Arn Kislenko. I'm a historian. My specialty is the 20th century, but I've come here to Jerusalem because I want to find out what life was like in the first century. Look at this, a job that's still here after 2,000 years, money changer. In this famous scene from the Gospels, Jesus sees the money changers in the temple. He overturns their tables and drives them out of the temple. Everybody's always been interested in the commotion Jesus caused. But I want to know what all these people were doing at the temple that day and what they all did for a living. What were their jobs like? And what drove the economy? The hillsides around the city of Nazareth contain ruins that date back to biblical times. They've helped archaeologists and biblical scholars recreate what Nazareth would have looked like in Jesus' time. James Tabor, a biblical scholar specializing in the life of Jesus, is here to show me just how real it is. But listen, James, was, was Nazareth really like this? I don't even think it could be reproduced, no matter what you did. Think yeah. about the crowdedness, the smells, the cacophony of sounds. The animals. Animals walking around, the dung in the street. I was the, thinking it must have stunk. It would have to. We're going to go into one of the houses here. Notice as we step inside through the door, we're actually outside in this courtyard area, this workshop area. 90% of the life is outdoors, even though you're in the house with a bit of shelter from the sun. Think of all of these activities that go on in a village, uh, particularly the manufacturing, like somebody's going to be making the pottery, somebody's going to be baking the bread. Or Everybody does that out of their the house. house. Out of their house. So it really gives you a sense of, of that workshop atmosphere. Right. And here's an example of the weaving. After shearing the sheep and washing the wool, the weaver does what's called carding the wool, opening it up and separating the fibers so they can work them on the loom. That's been cleaned and worked on. How long does it take you to clean the wool? Like uh, three, months. three or four months. And... Can I try that? Yes. Right. So I'm holding it like yes. that? And, you roll it. And spinning it. Yes, and move your fingers with it. You only need to control your fingers with the spindle. Okay. Yes, that's it. Yeah, that's easy for you move, to move, say. Move, move, move. Move, move your fingers. That's it. Okay. Do you work and forth. Yeah. Yes. Like that? Yes. OK, uh, I'll just let you do that. So everything's done here. Do yes. you dye the wool here yeah. as well? We dyeing the wool, we carding the wool, we spinning here, and after that, we take to the loom to make fabrics. But it's take a long, long, long process. But there's another job they're doing in this house that I want to see, because it's one of the most famous jobs in the Bible, carpentry. We've all been told that when Jesus wasn't overturning tables, he was making them. Now, some carpenters' tools haven't changed in 2,000 years, but some have. What's, uh, what's this tool for? It's a drill. A drill. It's nothing like my drill. Well, how do you use it? Can I try? <laughs> now I know where they invented power tools. Yeah. This is hard. Is it common to have a, a small child in the workplace? Like Absolutely. This? Judaism taught that uh, if you don't train your son in a profession, you've uh, abandoned him, basically. We're in a carpentry shop, most famous job in the world. I mean, is this how Jesus would have grown up? Yeah, I think that's the image people have. It's certainly in the movies and the books. We've been studying. Uh, the terms that are used, and Jesus is called a carpenter in English, but right. of course it wasn't written in English, written in Greek. Right. But the word actually is tekton, which means, and it means sort of artisan or a builder, like a stonemason, which really doesn't fit woodworking as much. Right. So it could be any kind of builder. You notice there's not a lot of wood in a home, right. but more stone. Lots of stone. And most of the examples when Jesus taught, he talks about stone so often. So it's Jesus the stonemason. Not Jesus the that carpenter. really does seem to be the best interpretation of, really? of the original text. I mean, that's totally different than everything else we've ever been told before. Yeah, I think yeah. the carpenter idea is romantic in a certain way. A better image is getting up at 3 in the morning and heading off 
to Sephras nearby for hard labor uh, at four or five in the morning, right. coming back near dark. Stone was the most important building material in biblical times and easy to get from the rocky terrain. So Jesus the stonemason may have worked right here. 2,000 years later, builders in Israel and around the world have hand-operated gantry cranes and water-cooled sawing machines. The modern builders here still use the local limestone. Building techniques might have changed, but the ancient skills are alive. For some buildings, the shaping and cutting of stone is still done by hand. So hot on the trail of the job that Jesus may have actually done, I'm heading off to the nearby town of Sepphoris. Because it's here, only three miles, but a world away from the village where he grew up, that Jesus may have gotten his first taste of the occupying power of Rome. This is James Strange, a world-renowned authority on biblical archaeology. He's been excavating Sepphoris for nearly 30 years, so he'll know why stonemasons nearby Nazareth could have worked here in Jesus' time. All the houses and buildings that you see over here to the left, oh, that's Nazareth. Right there. That's right. This is the economic center. So everybody from 18 miles around can come into this city and buy and sell. All the villagers, all the little hamlets, independent farmsteads, whatever they are. But also this city is in a major trade route that extends all the way to Italy and all the way to Egypt. So it's a trade hub. Yeah, very much so. Would Jesus have come here? When Herod the Great dies, this city revolts, and the Romans respond by destroying it. Then Herod the Great's son, Herod Antipas, inherits the city, so he gives orders that it be rebuilt. So thousands of workmen have to come in here. Someone has to cut the millions of stones that are in this mosaic floor. Incredible. Jesus very well could have come and worked here. Jesus, his father, his brothers could all have been here. That's incredible. In Jesus' time, the Roman Empire ruled over Judea. Pagan Roman life, with its many gods and liberal ideas, was very different from how the Jewish people lived and how they prayed to one God. So the young Jesus lived right at the intersection of traditional Jewish culture and the urban life of the occupying Romans. He wasn't raised to live as the Romans did, but he may have built their houses, huge houses, Here's what remains of one of them. I mean, look at our feet. I think it's the biggest threshold in the state of Israel, and it's the most finely cut. So I'm thinking a, a bureaucrat. Some kind of bureaucrat. In fact, I would guess we're looking at a magistrate. Right. <coughs> we come into the opulence of, That's right. of his office, <laughs> I presume. There was a pool right over here. That's a pool. That's a pool. There was another pool over here. So we had two Roman pools inside this building. This is astonishingly big and Roman. Even the administrators would be local people in the higher Rome. So they get co-opted into the, into the occupying. That's right. right, that's right. So the Romans didn't just occupy, they influenced many of the Jewish people. Many of them were Hellenized or Romanized, absorbing Greek and Roman culture right here in the busy city of Sepphoris. So what was it like here? It's the main road. It's absolutely teeming with life, people going everywhere. Uh, they're buying, they're selling, they're manufacturing. There'll be a laundry you can go in there. Uh, this will be selling spices, and it'll be very aromatic. It must have really smelled. It, it... Oh, yeah. You bet it did. Think about a fresh fish shop, and you're walking right by it, you know, with all this fish, and the sun's been on a little while. And then also, there are two drains underneath us, on either side of the street, actually, and all kinds of sewage is running through there. <laughs> so we're smelling fish, we're smelling sewage, we're smelling cinnamon, we're smelling perfume, we're smelling people. Depending on the prevailing winds, for example, you could be coming in from Tiberias and you could actually smell this city before you saw it. The ancients speak of that. Now, I wanted to ask you, though, you know, I'm always fascinated by these little things. So, you know, what are the people wearing and what are they, how do they keep clean in a place like this? Well, if they're wearing white, like they're a high-ranking person, then it has to be washed in urine. <laughs> That's the Roman technology. So it stinks. <laughs> it stinks. It's noisy. It's uh, energetic. There's a lot of things going on. So it's the Fifth Avenue of the ancient. It's something like that, a Fifth Avenue in a major city right in the ancient world. 
The Gospels tell us that when commerce threatened to take over the life of the temple, Jesus cracked the whip. And the seeds for that rage could have been sown here at Sepphoris, where Jesus was likely getting his hands dirty while trying to keep his soul clean. Jesus' job leads him to where the work is, and his ideas and philosophy begin to develop with huge consequences. This is how every day began in first century villages with women making bread before dawn. In the time of the Bible, the men went out early to work in the fields, but the women were up first, making a meal for them to take along. When it came to biblical jobs, women literally kept the home fires burning. If you didn't want to use sticks to create friction and heat, and if you didn't have a flint to create a spark, you kept the fire going at all times to heat your home and cook your meals. Food historian Tova Dickstein is an expert in the foods of ancient Israel. She's helping me to prepare your basic year one meal. I can't wait to see how it tastes. Is it healthy? I mean... Yeah, this is very healthy. Why? Because it's a complete nutrition. This is whole wheat. Right. Whole wheat with lentil. It's a complete protein. It's like meat. Ah, right. Yeah. So the wheat and the lentils together make up your protein. Protein. And okay. here you have calcium. They pick up the fig because they knew. I don't know how they know it, but you get the calcium from the figs. So these are the basic, basic, the basic food groups. Food. Exactly. It's so simple. It is That's very simple. That's the beauty of it. Yeah. yeah. If we were living in biblical times, would this be all we'd ever eat? No, this is the very basic ingredients, but people had more, like uh, vegetables, garden vegetables, fruit, olive. Now this smells amazing it really does and i'm not saying that because uh, i helped to make it so we use the bread as a as a scoop as a, as a spoon we would have had bread every meal in yeah. biblical times right yeah bread was the staple food every meal there, there were uh, poor people that this was the main dish bread was between 50 and 70 percent of the meal really yeah 70 percent of every meal almost every meal which is probably why the Gospel of Matthew contains a phrase that many of us know. Give us this day our daily bread. Tova, this is far better than I thought it would be. This is absolutely delicious. This diet provided all the nutrition you would need for a hard day of work in the fields. Many of the jobs here were connected to the land. On the day the Gospels tell us Jesus overturned the money changers table, some of the people in the temple were likely farmers. They would have come here to bring their first crops as an offering of thanks. With your life dependent on your crops and animals, you figure everyone would try and get along. But the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve had two sons. Cain was a farmer and Abel was a shepherd. And we know how that turned out. Ronit Meoz is an expert in ancient Israeli studies and she can tell us what agricultural jobs around here were like. A farmer, of course, would look at the shepherd as something very, very low, but I think the shepherd would look at the farmer as being a prisoner because he's tied to his land. So do you mean that farmers and, and shepherds would compete? Are not friends, especially if you have those goats. Beyond their use as food, in biblical times, goats were also used for temple sacrifices. These money changers that Jesus will confront are converting foreign currency. And one of the reasons pilgrims needed the local currency is so that they could buy animals to sacrifice in the temple. But before they meet their fate as lunch or sacrifice, goats have their own ideas. If she wants uh, to eat from a tree, she will climb or as much as she can and she will take the leaves. She will also take out the roots, something that the sheep cannot do. So for a farmer, she's really, she's a destroyer. Maybe that's why the farmer Cain and the shepherd Abel didn't get along. Abel's livestock really got Cain's goat. And the sheep were useful not just for food, but for making clothes. But first, you had to catch them. 
Would you like to lead this flock? Uh, Would you like to do that? Sure, let's give it a try. Okay. I can do that. Oi. Let's go. I think you forgot one. <laughs> oh, yes. Did you see that? Champion Shepherd. Is it terrible that I'm thinking lamb kebabs right about now? For the biblical farmer, the most important task was growing enough food for his family. Animals provided crucial help plowing the fields and growing staple foods. No wonder the Bible mentions animals so often. They were life and lifeline. Your mule, your cow, whatever animal you had is really your friend. She knows you. The most important thing in my world. She is, yeah. yes. Because yes. everything depends on her. Yes. But in the Bible, isn't there a reference to plowing a straight line? Jesus says to his followers, if you follow me, do it like you were plowing in the field. Just go straight after me. Don't look right, don't look to the left. Yeah. And that's okay. not easily done. All right. Yes. Yeah. Now the left one. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> yeah. I think she's more interested in eating than in plowing. Start going. You know, it's a lot easier to say that <laughs> than know, to do that. I know. Dia. Wrong dia. Wrong. Dia. Very good. Dia. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Look, 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 I'm doing it. Well, from morning to night, I'd from be out here tonight, plowing. morning to night, you'd be plowing now. It's really a lot of work. I'm sweating now. But you know that God said to Adam that with the sweat of your brow, you will get bread out of the land. Yeah. There we go. That's a girl. Biblical farmers developed a terracing system still in use here. Yeah. They cut large shells out of the hillside to prevent the soil from washing away. Here they grew barley and wheat and anxiously hoped they'd chosen the right amount of seeds to eat and to sow. So that's the actual barley? Just the seedlings, yeah. It's very important that they get settled now on the ground and that they grow and they get roots. So what's the worst thing that could happen as a farmer in biblical times? No rain, the worst. Nothing grows? This is going to be bread. So if there is no bread, there is no life here. From the time of the Bible right up to today, for the Jewish people, unless you've broken bread, you haven't had a meal. And in the Holy Temple, beyond the courtyard where the sacrifices were held, was the sanctuary. And the only food allowed in there was bread. But to grow the grains needed for your bread, you needed water. Being a biblical farmer meant looking to the skies and praying there would be enough rain. One of the toughest jobs was hauling water. And guess who did that? Actually, you are uh, now doing a typical woman's job, you know? This is a woman's work. Very hard work. Of course, very important. One of the hardest will be, be given either to the women or to slaves. Or university professors, too. <laughs> By the way, you know that it was a very hard job, but this is also the place of encounters. Women found their spouses. Really? Yes. The most important encounters happened by a well or a cistern. So this is like all the, the important marriages. This is the first century hangout. This is the internet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. First century Facebook. Of course, that's a matchmaking place here. At the well, chance encounters led to many important biblical marriages. Moses and Zipporah, Jacob and Rachel, Isaac and Rebecca. Now this place is not as well suited to matchmaking but it's just as important for collecting water. Ancient engineers designed this wooden treadmill connected to a ring of clay pots called a sequia. Now how it works is that you walk or run on this part of the wheel. And if you're doing it right, the wheel spins and those jugs up on top scoop up water from this pond and then drop them into that sluice at the top and then the sluice runs into a trough behind me where people would pick up the water for farming and drinking and so on. But you gotta keep going on this because the momentum really drops off quickly. So these are the jobs that would have surrounded Jesus when he was growing up. But many of his followers, the disciples, held a different profession, one we haven't seen so far. I want to find out why so many of them were in this profession, and I want to try and do this job. I'm in Israel, learning about jobs in the time of Jesus. 
And there's a pretty important job you can't miss if you read the New Testament, because at least four of the disciples of Jesus were fishermen. So I've come north to the Sea of Galilee to find out why. This is Chaim Weitzman, a second generation fisherman who grew up right here on the shores of the Galilee. We're gonna fish where the disciples fished and maybe find out the connection between this job and Jesus' earliest followers. Chaim, we gotta get a cover for your boat, a little roof going. Splash guard. That's a hat. <laughs> oh, I love that. Now I'm a fisherman. Yes, this looks good. Yeah, very good. So how did the disciples know where to find the fish? Like Chaim, they knew the waters around here, and they used their instincts. They didn't know his work, but they had Jesus. And the Gospels tell us he miraculously knew where to find the fish. We have sonar. We're fishing for tilapia, which has been swimming in these waters since before the time of the disciples. Now, they call it St. Peter's fish, named after, guess who? Very good. Fish, fish. Hey. Yo -ho -ho. Hey, look. Ah. Yes. <laughs> yes. What is he? Oh, good. My first fish in a net. Look at that. This is bigger, but mine's tougher. How many fish do we norm do you catch every it's day? It's one one hundred kilo. A hundred kilo. A hundred kilo, yeah. In one one net. W one net, yeah. Well, I caught slightly less than that. And I'm gonna cook them up biblical style. This is Barrett Gross, who manages Dex restaurant here in the Galilee. She's gonna show me how it's done. Me and Ata will be happy to take you. Great. Oh yeah, no? All right. You take the fish. You stick it through? Stick it through. I, <laughs> I believe that's the technical term. Okay. Great job, better than Ata. You see, the teacher became the pupil. This is a special type of uh, oregano. It's called hisop. Mm. Like that? Yeah. This is hot. The whole thing. And if you want to check if the fish is ready, yeah. you take the stick of the oregano. Okay. And you try to, you know. So this is my ancient fish thermometer. Yeah. If it goes through, it's ready. Hi, Jim. Hello there, Ari. How are you? All right. Look at that. I'm impressed. Ah, uh, wait a second. A little biblical uh, garnish here for you. A little as well. biblical garnish. Well, very nice indeed. While Jim enjoys my expertly caught and brilliantly cooked St. Peter's fish, I ask him about the biblical fishing business. First of all, you fish with nets. That's mm. that's what's economical if you're trying to do something commercial. And then when you fish with nets in the ancient world, you fish at night because the fish can't see the nets at night. In order to keep your clothes from being ruined by the wash and bringing in nets and so on, you usually fish naked. <laughs> <laughs> the TV viewers will be glad that I, I, I didn't try that experiment. That, uh, that's a little too much. These people, I mean, fishing in ancient times around here, they, are they are they poor? Oh, not at all. This is the most stable industry for this area. According to the writings of the first century eyewitness Josephus, the Galilee had a thriving economy with a salting factory to preserve fish for export. And with some of the catch, they made fish sauce, which was called garum. I'm meeting biblical food historian Susan Weingarten to learn how to do this fragrant job. We're going to cut these fish up, put them into the pot together with salt. The guts of the fish have enzymes in them. The enzymes will break down the flesh of the fish. The salt will prevent it from producing all sorts of harmful bacteria. And we leave it around for three months. Any kind of fish, right? <laughs> Any kind of fish. Everything goes in. Always a bit of salt in the middle. Now, what was garum used for? The top quality garum was used <laughs> as a condiment, as a flavouring, as rather you would use soy sauce nowadays. The lower quality ones was the sort of thing that you dip your bread into, perhaps. Right. And at the bottom, there's a sludge, which they used to eat. The sludge would contain the bones, mm. uh, which don't get digested by the enzymes. And it's these bones that we find archaeologically, and we can identify that this was a place where they made garum. Whose job would this have been? 
Other than mine. <laughs> Other than yours, <laughs> right. They, they would be made in factories. We found the remains of garum factories all around the Mediterranean. So this would have been a, a commodity. A commodity that was traded widely over the Mediterranean. King Herod imported garum from Spain. Spanish garum was the best. <clears throat> They've even found garum in Masada. Would this have been considered to be a, a, a good job as a garum maker? Or? A person working in the garum factory, I, I guess not, but a person that made all his money out of, the, out of owning the factory. I can't imagine this was a glamorous job. A glamorous, so. I can't imagine it either. So how long has this garum Let's been sitting? This garum's been sitting here for a month and a half, and this one for a bit over two months. Beautiful. Yeah, let's have a go. <laughs> Look, you can see the fish, the way they're all decaying. This is absolutely revolting. It wouldn't smell nearly so bad at the end of the process. This has to rank as maybe one of the worst jobs I would ever have to do. We didn't make you eat it, did we? No, and, and I'm really grateful that you didn't. So there are lots of fish in the sea, the Sea of Galilee, which could be sold, salted, and made into fish sauce for export. This was a good business. And in the nearby fishing village of Bethsaida, where many of the disciples came from, there's more evidence of how profitable the job fishing could be. Bethsaida is right on a major international trade route, the Via Maris. You've heard of the road to Damascus? Well, it starts down in Egypt, and goes right through here. This is the site of Bethsaida. It's a major city in Jesus' lifetime. The image in my head of poor fishermen gets dispelled in Bethsaida, where archaeologists have discovered evidence of a middle-class lifestyle. How do you know these were houses of the fishermen? Well, because um, weights from, for fishing nets have been found here. Um, they have actually found the the bones of fish here. This is the courtyard of the house of the fishermen. And this is the wine cellar. The wine cellar. And this is what we need to find out if they're wealthy or not. Because all the houses look the same on the outside. It's what's on the inside that tells us their level of wealth. They found tall jars of the type that are used for wine. If they're collecting wine and going to a lot of trouble to corbel this over, and to make a cool place, then they're, they're trying to preserve a collection of wine. Pretty wine. Yeah, yeah. You can store quite a lot, then. you? Yeah, so you don't express your wealth by decorating the house on the outside. You accumulate things on the inside that indicate your wealth. What would this tell you about the life of fishermen around here? Well, it tells us that they can accumulate a lot of capital, that they're really rather well off. The disciples, they weren't Poor. They're fishermen. They might be fishermen contractors. You know, they might have a lot of boats out there, and they might be doing very well. And they were better off than other tradespeople, basically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Some of them lived here. Yeah, some of them actually lived here. Came from Bethsaida, it's Peter good. and Andrew particularly. <laughs> right in this neck of the woods, isn't it? Yeah, we could be looking at their houses and not knowing it. You know, it makes sense that the disciples would have had well-paying jobs, because the Jesus movement is a rebellion, a revolution, and that takes cash as well as belief. We're seeing a transition between the Old Testament and the New, and jobs are one of the key differences. In the South, the farmers and shepherds of the Bible are at the mercy of the rain and the seasons. But in the North, the New Testament stories are all about fishing, a year-round and stable business. All right. We've seen the nice guys in the nature. Who isn't happy to meet a farmer or a fisherman? They provide food. But there were guys who did another kind of job in Jesus' time, and everyone hated them. No one was happy to see them show up. And yet, it's a job that one of Jesus' own disciples did. In the first century, the Roman Empire ruled over Judea. But not only were the people colonized, they had to pay taxes to Rome. And what did the Romans do with all the money? Some of it went in to build places like this. I'm here in the ancient city of Bet-Shean, and all I can say is, wow, this 
place is incredible. It is beautiful. It's massive. And I'm thinking that at its height, it must have been incredibly opulent. Everybody has that reaction. Their mouths just drop open. They think, you know, am I in Rome or Greece? And here we are in Jewish Roman Palestine. This area has been inhabited for over 9,000 years. And no wonder. Two rivers converge here in the lush Jordan Valley, making for a plentiful water supply as well as rich soil. And its location also has strategic importance, as the road north from Jerusalem intersects here with the coast road from Lebanon. So I, I got to ask, I mean, how on earth would you pay for something like this? Well, the simple word is taxes. And the Romans insist that conquered territories pay their own way as well as pay for this sort of massive building. What kind of taxes are we talking about? There are individual taxes per head and their property taxes, their cuts into a certain percentage of produce. We think it might be anywhere from 30 to 50%. For the poor, it had to be truly oppressive. It wasn't graduated, so if it was 30% of a smaller amount, I mean, you could barely get enough to eat. So when it comes to first century jobs, ruling over another country and collecting taxes from them is certainly one of the most profitable. So if it's an oppressive tax regime, I mean, is this like 1776 where you have the taxation without representation? Actually, I think three times we have record that Herod Antipas, who ruled Galilee, he reduced the taxes. And the only reason he would do that is uh, the people were finally saying as an, enough is enough. Right. And so, the well, final revolt was even over taxes. So what happens if, if you can't pay? Is there any sort of tax break? I think it's almost like tightening screws. The Client ruler Herod is watching to see how much you, pressure you can put on. In addition to all this splendor, which may not have interested the local workers who were paying for it, the Romans also used tax money to build roads and aqueducts, which did interest the locals. So there were mixed feelings towards the Roman conquerors and towards tax collectors. Not the most popular job then or now. But one of the disciples of Jesus was a tax collector, Levi, who was also called Matthew. With Jesus so opposed to Roman oppression, why did he have someone like this in his entourage? The Gospels tell us that Jesus is looking everywhere for sinners to repent, and I guess that includes tax collectors. Now we know how the IRS reacts if you don't pay your taxes, but what was it like in biblical times? So what happens if there's a, a drought or a famine and, and you can't pay your taxes? There's no mercy. You could go to jail. You could lose your land. You know, maybe you own a family plot of land and all of a sudden uh, it's uh, given over to some rich landowner. And were people killed for this? Was there execution for not paying your taxes? We do have examples of 2,000 people being crucified. Really? up and down the road here in Galilee. For not paying their taxes. Because they joined a, an anti-tax revolution. Imagine seeing crosses up and down a Roman road. Yeah, <laughs> I'd start amazing. paying my taxes at that point. That's exactly right. Beyond your basic greed, the Romans also found that taxing everything and everybody dovetailed nicely with that other pillar of empire building, trade. Trade routes allowed them to tax goods at every stage of the journey. And it was merchants, another important job in the time of the Bible, who had to deal with both taxes and trade. Getting your wares to the big cities sometimes involved a great deal of travel, especially for certain goods that the city absolutely could not do without. For instance, in Jerusalem, they had to have frankincense. Without it, there could be no temple worship. Why not? What is frankincense anyway? And where does it come from? I've come to the Negev Desert to trace the frankincense trail and learn more about the men who couldn't do their jobs without it, the priests, the same men who clashed with Jesus. From this famous scene in the New Testament where Jesus overturns the money changers' table, I've been learning about the jobs all these people did in biblical times and how their professions could have brought them all to the holy temple in Jerusalem on that day. There was another very important job practiced by those who were already at the temple, the priest. 
priests were the link between the people and their god, performing animal sacrifices and burning a special incense called frankincense as an offering. Frankincense begins as a tree resin from southern Arabia, but to get it to Jerusalem, it used to have to go through this. I'm in the Negev Desert, taking the same route the merchants and camel drivers took. And I'm here to meet Yunus Aburabea and his herd of camels. Salam alaikum. This is my camel. Okay. What's his, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shailat. Shailat. Okay. Shailat. The job of camel driver hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. The most important thing is to look after your animal, because we're a long way from anything. They're incredible animals, smarter than the vehicles that replace them. And unlike cars and trucks, they can go over almost any terrain. Cover up my big head. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bedouins always feed their guests. And if we were ancient merchants, we would certainly need to be fortified for the journey, taking frankincense through the desert to Jerusalem. Mm. That is delicious. Now I'm ready for my first camel ride. Ole, kid. Okay. Oh, I'm on a camel. <laughs> That's great. And now what do I do? How do I, uh, you know, I should have read the manual before I, uh, I bought the camel. Okay. <laughs> There's no instructions <laughs> for this. All right. Whoa. That's the big camel. <laughs> uh -huh. Whoa. That is something else. This is the only way to haul cargo in the desert. These guys are the 18-wheelers of the Middle East. Out here, I can imagine that in the first century, there would have been hundreds of camels and caravans stretched out across the horizon, hauling goods from thousands of miles away towards Jerusalem. And there were jobs along the way, too. Since camels shed, their owners made money from their hair, which was used to make clothing. Remember spinning the yarn back in Nazareth? Imagine doing it while on the road to Jerusalem. Out here, you make use of everything you can, and you paid a toll or tribute to Rome in territories you passed through. No wonder frankincense was so expensive. By the time it got here to Jerusalem, it had been taxed to the hill. Sook or marketplace here in old Jerusalem. Now, a lot of things have changed over time, but you can still get goods here that were sold during biblical times. This is frankincense. We know it best as one of the gifts that was brought to baby Jesus by the three wise men. How much is this? This is 100 gram, 12 shekels. 12 shekels for, yeah. for one. For one, yeah. For one? Yes. Can I smell that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Sakram. It's very beautiful frankincense. That's beautiful, yeah. It's good for smell, good for memory, good for all, uh, anything. Because that many people before 2,050 years ago, he's put it, all of this in his home. So 2,000 years ago, yeah, this was people. used. So everyone. Everyone. Some people believe frankincense to be an effective anti-inflammatory and current medical studies are testing other benefits. But the ancients knew that burning frankincense was an offering they had to make to God. It's still burned in churches today. And 2,000 years ago, pilgrims coming to Jerusalem and entering the temple would have inhaled its sweet fragrance. Three times a year, the Jewish people came to the temple from all over the world for the major festivals. I'm in old Jerusalem, and this is the Western Wall. It's the only above ground structure that's left of the temple that the Romans destroyed. The Temple Mount 
is the holiest place in Judaism, and the Western Wall is its only physical remnant. Just up here on Temple Mount, the very first temple was built about a 1,000 years before Jesus was born. People come here 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, to pray in this square. Many of them write prayers on small scripts and place them in the wall. Others kiss the wall. The pilgrims brought animal sacrifices to the temple, but they didn't bring a goat or a dove with them halfway around the world. So the first thing they had to do was convert their currency so that they could buy animals to sacrifice. So what about this job, money changer? Did Jesus really object to it? After all, without it, pilgrims couldn't buy and offer their sacrifices. It wasn't the job. It was where the job was located, inside the temple. This crowded city of pilgrims attracted merchants of every kind. It was a good place for business. But Jesus didn't want the temple turned into a business. And some say the priests were allowing it to happen. I want to find out more about this job, which was unlike any other, and answered to a boss unlike any other. In the pressure cooker of Jerusalem, how did these priests balance religion, commerce, Rome, and the first century rebel? In the time of the Bible, Jerusalem was as busy as it is today. Three times a year, pilgrims came from all around to offer sacrifices in the temple that used to be beyond this wall. Jerusalem's pilgrims were great for local jobs, then and now. There were food vendors, there were hostel owners, and there were merchants of every kind. But unlike today, there were thousands of priests who served in the temple. These priests were in the temple to represent the people before their god, and nothing could interfere with them performing their holy functions. The most important functions were performed by the high priest. But under Roman occupation, there was plenty of interference with this job, and Rome made sure that the man it wanted was appointed. His duty was to God, but pleasing Rome allowed him to fulfill that duty. So he and the other priests had a delicate tightrope to walk. Shimon Gibson is a world-renowned biblical archaeologist who directs excavations in Israel. He can bring us closer to the lives of these men, for whom ritual purity was the key to being able to do their job. So here you can see one of the gates uh, which led into uh, the temple area. This is the place where all the pilgrims who had been purified in the Salaam pool, and including the priests who had come from the upper city, would enter into the temple area. So everybody comes right through here? Exactly. And it must have been a, a pretty chaotic scene if you've got all these people coming in. And... Fairly chaotic, but you had a very, very strict administration. How so? And had uh, the, the temple administrators. They would make sure that only those who had been purified in the pools were allowed into the temple. Everyone had to immerse in a special pool, called a mikvah, before entering the holy temple. Its purpose was not for physical cleanliness, but for ritual purity. There were large mikvahs for the pilgrims, like this one, the Pool of Siloam, mentioned in the New Testament and recently discovered near where the temple stood. And the water was on different levels. So um, whenever the pool was at a lower level, then you'd descend the steps. If the water was at a higher level, then you could uh, remain uh, closer to the So top. this went continually down it, like All that. the way down to the bottom. And the steps were on all four sides, which is quite nice. So you've got to imagine almost like a theater with all these people sitting around. Uh, and uh, they've all come here in order to purify themselves before going up to the temple. It was critical that priests become pure before entering the temple. One became impure by coming into contact with death. For instance, being in the presence of a dead body. And life's potential was sacred. So both the presence of semen that had not conceived, as well as menstrual fluid, required a trip to the mikvah. The priests believed that if they were impure when they entered the temple, 
everything they were trying to accomplish in the prayers for their people would fail. There were, and still are, strict rules about what kind of water could be used in a ritual bath. It couldn't be brought in by unnatural means. It had to be rainwater, or from a spring or river. Since nothing was more important than this ritual purity, some of the priests had their own private mikvahs. Shimon Gibson is digging in what is believed to have been a priestly quarter of ancient Jerusalem. And he has discovered what is believed to be a priestly house. So we're going to go down here. We're actually going to descend uh, through time because we're at the level of the Ottoman period. Right up which here. Is, yes, which is uh, uh, mid-16th century. And we're going to go all the way down to 2,000 years to the levels from the first century, from the time of Jesus. Fantastic. So we're going to descend the elevator of time. How do you know that there were priestly houses as opposed to somebody else's house? Well, we have historical sources. We also have um, archaeological findings. Excavations revealed a house uh, with an inscription indicating that this was a house which belonged to the priestly uh, family. I mean, these were the neighbors of King Herod the Great and subsequently of the, the Roman governors of uh, Jerusalem because the Roman governor was situated just up uh, slope from where we are. Jerusalem was a very wealthy city, uh, being the focus of pilgrims uh, three times a year. Those who lived in Jerusalem were able to sell their goods to them, were able to rent out uh, their houses. So you don't have a lower class in Jerusalem. You have the middle class, those who are better off and those who are less better off, and the aristocracy and the, the priesthood. People also sort of think of Jesus coming to, to Jerusalem and then uh, moving in and around, the, in between the houses of the poor. But there were no poor people in no... Jerusalem at the time. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah, I never thought of that. So there's a lot of animal bones here, and uh, you can see them sort of scattered around. Here you can see a rib bone. Ah, oh, look, look. There's a coin. Do you see that green? It's corroded. It's That's green. That's why it's got that green sort of skin to it. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. And what's nice is it's caught between these two stones. It'll give us some information about when this uh, wall was constructed. Take it out. You are actually trusting me. Well, since you're here oh, at the right. site, you've got to dig it out. The one thing you don't do is uh, rub the surface because it's corroded. And so it can actually peel away almost like an onion. And, and with it, it can take the image, which is on the, 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 the coin itself, on the metal. This is the loose change, just like you find loose change all over the place, modern and loose change, you know, same in, in antiquity. I have to um, give it up. Is yes, you have to. It's, it's not a souvenir. From the okay. moment of discovery, it belongs to the state of Israel. That's, I knew that. That's, I knew that. That's the law. So there we go. And that is my, uh, my first ever archaeological find. Your fingers have touched history. I know. That's beautiful. It really is. Mm. It's exciting. There's always a first time, isn't it? Touching history is quite a change from teaching it. But there's more to see as we descend further into history. Shimon is using geophysical mapping technology to see what hasn't yet been excavated. And he discovers something incredible at the lowest level of this house. And lo and behold, uh, in this area, we found this hidden chamber with its ceiling still intact. Oh, fantastic. It's really amazing. Oh, oh my. <laughs> Look at that. You're it's in the there. cellar of the priestly house, and it's here that you have this mikveh, which is this uh, ritual pool. If you came in from the marketplace, you might have uh, brushed shoulders with a, a leper, which had uh, made you impure. So if you're entering into the house, the first thing you did was you went to purify yourself in, in the mikvah. Finding a mikvah in the home of a priest tells us just how crucial ritual purity was. It wasn't only in the temple. They needed to be pure everywhere they went in the city of God. When Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers, these priests would have felt that he was overturning their world. The delicate balance they had achieved between their God and the Romans. And here in his house, we can touch this man's life, this vanished job, temple priest. But this is extraordinary. 